Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, my name is Maria, and I'm alcoholic. Um, my sponsor's name is Jenny H. She's in New Zealand. My home group is Saturday Moss Bay in Kirkland. It's on eight, at 8.30 on Saturday morning. And let's see, home group, sponsor, what else? Wasn't there something? Like that's it. Got it. Oh, it's a Friday day. Thank you. January 31st of 2008. I knew there was something. Um, so, <laughs> this uh, TikToker thing is loud. <laughs> like, oh my god. That's like that 60 minute show. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so it's actually been about maybe a year and a half since I spoke, and it was the last time I was at that, this meeting. And, um, you know, I was, I was I had a sponsor here with me. Thank god, it was a long drive over from the east side today, and so I see familiar faces. And this is actually my first home group when I moved here to uh, Seattle just about two and a half years ago. And I moved here to go to medical school, and so my brain is so off right now because of finals last week, so I really apologize. Like, I got no brain energy left. And, um, you know, it's funny. I ride this great high and I'm doing well in finals, and, and of course, you know, it's AA. We're not surprised. We do well. We do well at everything that, that we're, we're given, right? But I want to parade that, uh, man, I'm, like, coming down from my lull from all last week's work and um, just kind of that reality of what's going on. And um, so I also want to thank Julie for getting me to speak up here, so I really appreciate it. I, uh, You know, these speaking commitments give me a chance to reflect every once in a while and, and see where I'm, where I'm at, how am I doing, what's going on. And, um, and you know, today I'm, I'm emotionally hungover, man, you know, and, 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 and someone said it really well. I was like, darn, don't you just wish you could speak on the days that you're like, really great, yay, but... I'm, I'm tired and, and I'm a little emotionally hungover. So I had a tough day. I, I fired a sponsee, and it was only the second time in my entire sobriety that I've done that uh, today. And so that that's weighing really heavy on me. And um, so a lot of talk about sponsorship has been on my mind lately and what, what it means to have a strong sponsor and the point of a sponsor, you know. And, um, you know, my sponsor, Jenny, um, God bless her heart, you know, we stuck together because we both moved west. You know, we met. In New Jersey, she had actually known me for a lot of my sobriety, and um, a few other sponsors weren't working out. You know, I had like my one glorious sponsor that took me through the steps, and I and I connected with her so much, and and we needed to move on, and then um, and then I just couldn't find anyone like that 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 really spoke to me until I found Jenny again. And what happened is, um, you know, when you find that person, you stick to them and you chase you chase them down. You know what I mean? You find them, you stick down, and you just like. I, I chase Jenny, you know, I really do. I have a weekly phone call with her. I don't miss it. I go, you know, I separate myself from whatever I'm doing to take that phone call. I get down, I get present. And um, and, and if the sponsee's not doing that with you, I probably look at that relationship, you know, kind of what happened today. So, um, you know, my sponsor invests her time in, in me to do that. and gives me on her, her undivided attention. And I'm expected to give the same in return, you know. And, um, you know, the thing about sponsorship is that I always thought that there's two things that, that need to be in order for sponsorship to work. One is, is that I, my sponsor's voice needs to be louder than my own head, always. <laughs> not just some of the time, not just when I want to hear it, not just when I'm not, like, you know, not unteachable or whatever it is. My sponsor always has to be louder than my own head because my life depends on it, you know? And um, and the other thing is, is that I got to have... I want, I gotta um, want what my sponsor has, and that doesn't mean the things or something, but something where I aspire because she's doing more than I am in something. You know what I mean? And so I do that because I emulate the same thing for my sponsors. I do things. I, I, I have a home group still. I saw, I watched my sponsor move to New Zealand. She's like, I don't know, 27 years sober, right? Service commitments, meetings, sponsor. I mean, did the same thing that I did. When, and you know what? Because of that, when I moved here six months later, I did exactly the same thing. Home group meeting, sponsorship. I did not miss a beat because moving is a really big deal. A lot of people drink when they move, and I was scared, you know. And I talked to a lot of AAs about moving, and I had a plan when I came here. And, and this home group was actually part of that plan, so I'm really grateful to it. Thank you. Long drive. <laughs> like, but, uh, man, I'm really grateful to it. And um, so... 
you know, the other part of it is, is that sponsorship has saved my life, you know, being here because my sponsor's in New Zealand, right? So that means that during the rest of the week, I, I need to um, really keep an eye out and, and walk this walk, right? That doesn't mean I get to slack off just because I check in with my sponsor once a week. I, I, I stay very much on the straight and narrow. And, uh, and the way I do that is by sponsoring other people. And that may mean that I visibly F up, you know, I actually have a really funny story about this. I'm going to tell you guys, because this is why it keeps me sober. So I was, uh, there was a girl that I was sponsoring at a halfway house in New Jersey where I got sober. And, uh, one morning I was, I just, I didn't pray that morning, you know, and I, I, I always get on my knees and I pray the third and seventh step prayer. I didn't pray. And, uh, I was feeling really self-righteous that morning because I was going for an organic co-op. I was like in a mood, right? You ever get that mood where I'm like, oh, so yeah. And I was going to pack all the things for it. And, um, and I have a big truck and I was but, like flowing down the street past this Mrs. Wilson's house, this three quarter house, and halfway house. And uh, I get a phone call and uh, I'm speeding, right? And I don't do that. I really don't do that very often, but God doesn't let me stray far, right? So I get a phone call. And it's, it's a sponsee, and she's like, hey, Speed Racer, I, you just almost ran over me. And I'm like, what are you doing, right? And I'm like, where are you going, right? Classic alcoholic, I turn it on you like you're the one who's on fault. I got caught, right? I'm just embarrassed. But but I'm, <laughs> but I'm going to, you know, so I was like, well, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm walking to work. I was like, yeah, well, where did you cross the street? She said, oh, so and so. I was like, so you're jaywalking. Oh, I see. You know, and I'm like, and then I, I started laughing and I'm like, dude, do you hear me? Like, I am being such a jerk for 830 in the morning. Like, you know, and I was like, I'm trying to call you out on your thing when you just caught your sponsor behaving badly. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Like, I'm going to stop. I pulled over and I prayed and I stopped and I said, thank you so much because you probably saved me from a speeding ticket with the attitude that I had this morning. You know what I mean? Like, that's what sponsorship does. It doesn't let me stray too far. So, so I call it, like, I feel like I'm on God's kitty leash. You know that leash that you have at the mall? The little kid has the vest, and it's, like, spring back. Ah, but then you, like, come back. That's how I feel, you know? Like, I'll do what I want, but, but I don't get I don't get away with much, you know? And I'm, I am really grateful for that because it, it hurts too much these days, you know? And so I come before you, like, Brad, you know, who spoke before, and, you know, I don't have my stuff together, you know, ever. I don't think it's ever supposed to be like that. I'm here just to be real. Speaking of, so then I was reminded, uh, the first thing I was told to do was to go get this book in the, um, in the bookstore called The Velveteen Rabbit. And it's this childhood story about the rabbit who gets all used up and beaten down and he becomes real. And, and uh, just to preface, I'm an immigrant, so I didn't have this book growing up as a child. I thought that it was some, like, amazing Buddhist writing that was six volumes long when my sponsor told me about it. So in my egotistic thing, I was expecting some like real, you know, fine print literature. But and when I went to the Barnes and Noble, they directed me to the children's section. <laughs> you know, phew, and, <laughs> and I'm like, this can't be and uh you know that's that's the whole point. You know, again, a sobriety, phew, get my ego down. And I and I read it, I'm like, okay, I see your little cute point, right? Like I'm supposed to get real, I'm supposed to be vulnerable. And but you know, she brought up a really great point. I have, I have a really hard time doing that. And so to tell you a little bit of my past, you know, like I said, I was an immigrant. I am an immigrant when I came here when I was six. And um, I came from Estonia, which is a Scandinavian country, and we're a very flat, affected, monotonous uh, people. And uh, that's fine, but, you know, everything is beautiful on the outside. And, um, and I was kind of like this free-spirited, like, had a lot of emotions kid, right? And um, when we moved... Both my parents were physicians, but they couldn't work as doctors, so they worked as a janitor and as a technician. And, and my job at six years old was to take care of the family. You know, I raised my brother, I cooked, I cleaned, I did all the laundry, and I had done that from age six on. And um, and I also come from an alcoholic home, so there was a lot of a lot of unpredictability. And and you know, and if you guys come from an alcoholic home, you know, I don't even have to say it. The point is that. By the age of eight, I felt that it was my time to start drinking whatever was left over at the tables. And so I can't give you like a wonderful first drink story because my first drink was at the age of eight and I don't remember something miraculous. I just remember it being like, like, like just regular. Do you know what I mean? It was just like, it, that was just my being. That was what my calling was. It just seemed right. There was, you know what I mean? There was no big poof about it. It just was. And, um, you know, the uh, a weird hard part happened when I got sober. I got disowned by my family uh, when I got sober because it was 
very appalling for them to say that, you know, a child was, was so broken, you know, and so I think it's so, like disowned beings in my behaviors. It, it just, it was shameful to them that I needed AA and that I was alcoholic, not, not that I couldn't drink normally. So, so that just gives you a little light about what I grew up in. And, um, the other thing is then, um, you know, we obviously had all these outside stuff and I'm missing the boat on a lot of cultural references because of the being an immigrant thing and learning English thing. And, uh, I also, by the way, um, grew up in inner city St. Louis. So there was a little white girl there and, um, I talked very differently <laughs> a long time ago and I was a delinquent. I, I had a lot of behavioral problems, but the thing was that I was a goody two shoe up until eighth grade, like such a straight and narrow goody two shoe, always the top of my class. And I would like help you smoke your cigarettes, but I wouldn't do it. Right. I always be an accessory to things and, and absolve myself of, of like, see, I'm not doing it. I'm helping you with it. And then finally, I remember I was 14 and something happened and, um, I, I kind of basically, it was my F you day to God. And I remembered that part clearly. I was like, F you God, like I'm alone. My family sucks. It's violent. Um, no one loves me. I'm getting, I'm doing everything that you asked me for. I'm getting all these A's. I'm a varsity soccer player and basketball player. I'm, you know, it's like, and I'm not getting anything in return. You know what I mean? Like that's, I, I felt like that that day. And I said, F you. And, and I started smoking and dating all the cute drug dealers and, and, uh, and, you know, it's just like, I did everything when I was 14, like everything. And, um, and, you know, I felt like I deserved it. You know, it was like, I was an eight. And it's just, I, it, 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 this was just my turn. And, um, so I had a real big problem of entitlement. And, um, the other thing was that I was really arrogant, but it's so sweet about it. So you never suspect me. <laughs> like, so they call me little white girl with attitude. That was my nickname in my sports team. Cause I, I would hurt other players, but I'd never get caught because I just looked too sweet. And that was, <laughs> they didn't think that I was capable of it. And that's the story of my drinking until I got sober when I was 22. Like, doing a lot of effed up stuff and, and not getting caught um, because it just didn't look like I could do that. And, um, you know, I wore that. I wore that badge, right? Like, being from this tough thing and and, um, and being from this tough family. But I wouldn't tell you that, right? I didn't, no one knew. And I'd smoke and I can going to do all these things. And uh, my parents thought that, you know, being in St. Louis was a problem, so they moved me to rural Minnesota, thinking that was going to help fix me. And uh, that wasn't the only reason. There were others, but that contributed to, to them moving there. And that was awful, because <laughs> now I, like, finally felt at home with my St. Louis people that I worked so hard to feel at home with, right? And... Um, I'm in Minnesota and everyone talks different and it looks different. And I'm like the girl in the leather boots and fishnets and punk, you know, like it just like didn't fit in in Abercrombie and Fitch world over there. And I didn't never heard of Dave Matthews. Like I was like, what, <laughs> what is this? And I, I did not like it. Right. And, um, and they all said that I talked with like a Southern drawl and I listened to, you know, that it's more of like a metal punk person. And, and I, uh, so I ended up in the first attention there was, right, at this like, big, giant school, this big, giant puppy school. And I'm there with, you know, when I was in high school, the trench coat mafia was the thing, right? And um, so I'm in there with all the trench coat mafia kids, right? And, and here I am, like, see, little Maria. And they're like, what are you doing here? You don't belong. And I was like, you don't know, <laughs> you know? And uh, I just, you know, it's like, that was my way of being sneaky. And, uh, you know, and, and my parents found out that I wasn't being, that my friends weren't the bad influence. It was me who was the bad influence. Like, I was not a follower. That was the problem. So I prayed every night when I was in Minnesota for five months. I prayed every single night. I said, God, I will do anything. Just get me out of here. And I was starting to run away. I'm doing all this stuff. And I said, I will be a good girl. Just get me out of here. I'll change, you know, anything. And so my dad got a job in New Jersey, and I, he was, he was still drinking a lot. He was, he was fully alcoholic, and um, he, he was drinking a bunch, and I found out he got this job. So I packed the minivan, and at 15, drove from Minnesota to New Jersey while he was drunk, like, to go. And I was like, we're out of here. We're going now. Like, you know, and, like, that's how, that's what I'm like, you know. And, um, you know, I'm also, I was really small for my age, you know. Like, I'm 31. I've always looked smaller and younger, so I can't imagine what I look like, like, driving with a drunk dad and a 15-year-old with a fat. I just can't imagine what that looks like right now, you know. And so we go to New Jersey, and I, and I get on better behavior. You know, I do what's asked of me. I've always 
always in that. But now I just, I felt like my soul was dead. You know, I didn't like it in New Jersey, but, but I got what I prayed for and, and I was going to be good. At 17, I graduated and, you know, I decided that America was my problem. I went back to Estonia thinking that that was going to solve it. That was not happening. They were burning American flags and giving me all kinds of hate speech about how I'm not Estonian. And there's just like, no matter where I went, I was this, this mutt, you know what I mean? It's like, it felt like I couldn't fit in anywhere. And so I come back, you know, to the States and I go to Rutgers and, and all I could do is drink, you know what I mean? I, I try to hang out with some of my friends from high school, but I just, they just drank all the time. I didn't drink like a party girl. I didn't dance on tables. You, you, know, you can never get me to dance. I was just a wallflower. And, um, I really just like to hang out and, and drink beers and whiskey. You know, that's the kind of girl I was. And, um, you know, I um, I would do it. The problem was that it was round the clock drinking, right? And then I had to be drunk all the time. Like, uh, I remember when I gave a drunken phone call to my brother and I said, oh, I think I'm alcoholic. And he's like, why do you feel you need to drink to, like, go to the grocery store? It's like, you don't like, I don't understand. Like I, I need a few to like get to a grocery store. Like I can't do that otherwise. And, and I, I couldn't stop, you know what I mean? I was in my early twenties. I couldn't stop. Obviously bad things were happening to me. Like, you know, and I was doing bad things. I mean, college girl, it just, it was a bad thing. Right. And, and the way I say it is that there are things that I hope my parents never find out about, you know? Um, and the thing is that, um, you know, for being so sweet looking, I got into a lot of fights and, and I, and I, I got, I caused a lot of trouble, but I, again, always got away with it. And, um, so really what I was left with by the time I was 22 was my spiritual bankruptcy. You know, I didn't have people, I wasn't leaving my apartment because I didn't want these bad things to keep happening to me. Right. I was doing that for like a year and a half at that point. I, you know, I was doing everything I could to switch the drinking. You know, it's like, oh, there's a gin phase. Oh, my body's too drunk and weird things happen, but my mind's clear. That sucks. No, no, no more gin, you know? And, or then like the beer while well, I was gaining a lot of weight on the beer, you know? And it's just like, I kept switching all this stuff. And, and, um, you know, like I was saying, I, uh, I had a spiritual bankruptcy that happened and it happened after I was, you know, I, um, this wasn't the first time that I did it, but I drove up, driven up to the Catskill mountains up there, like maybe two hours away. And I, just wanted to not come back, you know, I didn't, I wasn't suicidal, you know, I prided myself in not being suicidal, actually, I was like, no, never will kill myself, but I conveniently wanted to be gone, <laughs> you know, like, so I would do these things to go to motels, and I would idolize how these rock stars die, because that's what, that's what my life was, I thought I was a rock star at that time, you know, I was definitely living like one, and, um, and I thought I'd go out like a rock star, so I was doing that, and, uh, and, and this one time, you know, it was my first sobriety date, it was October 26th, and I, I just couldn't get drunk. Like it was awful, right? And then it happened a couple times before, but I had a, I had a mission, right? Like I was really trying to die in that hotel room and, and that's, it's, that's not what happened. And, um, you know, and I was remembering all these other friends who had died and, and here's just a little picture. Like I know it doesn't seem like college kids get into a lot of trouble, but all my friends were dead. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't, again, just some little girl who drank too much. All my buddies had died, and I was and I was supposed to be next, you know. And and I'll never forget that being at that table and you know seeing seeing four of us in the middle of the night. And I was like, I just had this epiphany. I'm like, oh, oh, I'm gonna die. It was like like uh like that movie where each person dies in the roller coaster. <laughs> that way out, that one. That's how I felt. Like it was my turn. And <laughs> there we go, final destination. And um and you know within the year, each one of those did die. And within the year I got sober. And, um, you know, one of the guys' parents, you know, said that's actually one of the best gifts that you can give to us because our son never got sober. You know, actually whoever his uncle is somewhere sober out here or never met him or anything. But I remember that was one of my amends was, you know, I wrote a card or letter and put it on his grave site. And I went to his family and I said, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I just set up in the whole thing that you guys taught me to do, you know? And, and they were just so happy. They said, if, if, if our if our buddy or if our son Tom Seth can do that for you, then then it was not in vain, you know. And um, and the thing is that like, what's so hard is that with the outside appearances, right? It definitely doesn't look like I'm living that kind of life. You know what I mean? I'm such a secret to everyone, right? I'm such a secret. No one knows the pain that I've gone through. No one. I've never opened up to anyone in my life. In fact, when I did open up to people, I would just have like this flat affect like it didn't look it, it felt sociopathic you know and and i think that that's what happened you know after after my first full round of that after a year of sobriety something happened where 
where I didn't say that stuff so matter of factly. Do you know what I mean? Because that's just what was taught to me. I, 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 I began having a little heart. And so there was an ongoing joke that, like, I remember my sponsor took a picture of me the first time she saw me smile was at eight months sober. She snapped a picture of it, like that kind of thing. Um, another thing was I felt like that little, you know, it's Christmas time. So like, you know, the Grinch heart, that's all bleeding and or fat black and falling apart. That's what I had. And it's like, I don't have that now, you know, like I do have this amazing heart, but it's just, I, I'm reminded that it's, it's, it, it hurts sometimes, you know, like I don't have alcohol to make me tough on the outside and get through this stuff. And so, so I heavily rely on the literature and my sponsor for my sobriety not just for the staying away from a drink, but so that I can live a day at a time because I didn't know how to live, you know? And so that's really the point of all that, that I was been reflecting on, you know, with sponsorship and, and today and leading to fire someone which sucks so bad. Don't, that sucked. And, um, you know, when, when I do that, it's not about the drinking anymore. It's about that I can be just as dry when, you know, and I can watch it. And I, you know what? I hope my sponsor fires my ass when I'm acting like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I really hope she can do that for me because that sucks so bad. We are here to save each other's butt, not to save your face. You know what I mean? Don't tell me what I'm going to like. Tell me what's going to save my life because that's why I'm here. And if I'm going to offend you, then you're in the wrong room, my friend. You know what I mean? Like, wrong room. Go somewhere else because we're, we're going to offend you. And, um, man, like, I'm so glad I got offended so many times. Oh, my God. I was, like, I almost drank so many times. And my sponsor, she thought, I'm going to hang up that quick. She hung up on me so many times. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it, it's amazing, you know. But I needed that because I, I was walking through the world like I owned it. And, um, you know, the other thing is that left to my own devices, my mind takes me to really like dark places and, and, and I'm reminded of the rubber band and how it wants to go back to its default position. I think I'm doing so great, right? Until after finals. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm reminded where its resting position likes to go. And you know, that, that happens. Like I was reminded too, with any time change happens or transitions happen. You know, I see that, that it's, you know, I may do all this work, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's all gone. It's just that I've done the work to keep it at bay. It's my daily medicine that I have, you know, I need to do this daily. And, um, so I've been having that, you know, in, in the middle of my emotional hangover and, and lull, all this like really dark thinking was coming in during the last two days. And I was, and, uh, and then I'm grateful that one time in a meditation, um, this, I, I pictured what that, thing looks like and it looks like a little troll and I don't know if you guys know the little like rumple still skinny looking troll that riddles me something over the bridge right that kind of that's what my my evil troll looks like and it likes to come out and play every once in a while it just like does it and it gets in my head and it plants little thoughts and sees if they take you know it just it's crazy and and uh you know I don't have to do it often but it'll happen a couple times a year you know and and the only thing that gets me out of it is a speaking commitment or, you know what I mean? Or working with someone. It's never any like cerebral thing. It's not something I need to figure out. It's because of what my feet do, you know? And so, you know, my feet are what keep me sober. It's not about thinking my way through the program. It's, it's about getting to know that book in and out. You know, I learned the big book through the Joe and Charlie CD that, oh my gosh, they like saved my life. You know, I read the big book regularly, love going to big book studies. I had this whole binder of cool things I learned and you know, I, I made myself a student of AA and, and, um, you know, my feet are, are all that's important in AA. It doesn't matter what my headspace has been for the last two days. Cause in the meantime, I showed up to a meeting last night. I showed up today. I showed up to a sober girlfriend's party. You know, I showed up to be a good roommate, you know, like I showed up to whatever, all that stuff. I showed up. It doesn't it, just cause I get to be like in a weird headspace doesn't mean the rest of the world needs to commiserate with it. Right. And so, so that brings me up to something else, you know, that sobriety brings in some really tough go sometimes, right? So like I said, I haven't spoken in a while because I've been quite ill. And, um, so, and so like a year and a half to a year ago, I wasn't walking very well. And my father moved in and he helped me out with that a lot. And, and today, just to be able to walk on the stage, I was nearly in tears, you know? And I know for the people who don't see it, it's hard to imagine that. But that is what it is. And so I had these women bringing me meetings and, um, and, you know, even though all this stuff goes on, that doesn't mean that I get to treat someone badly because of what I'm going through. You know what I mean? And, um, and that's been one of the biggest things I learned in AA was, was it doesn't matter what I'm going through right now. It doesn't matter if I had a bad day. I don't, I don't get to go make someone else have a bad day because of it. 
never. I don't get to do that. I might drink over that, you know? And um, the other thing is, you know, I heard this uh, speaker CD where he said, he's like this old timer, 50 years sober, and his lovely wife is across from him, and they're cute and, you know, adorable in the morning. And they ask him, how do you stay in love with your with your wife all the time? You know, you're sober, aren't you bored? It's the same thing every day. And he says, no, you know, my, my wife could have had a spiritual experience the day before. And my job is to find out today. Maybe maybe that's what it was. You know, and so like my job is to treat each of you as if maybe you had a spiritual experience last night, not to bring your old history into things. You know what I mean? That's something really important for me, too. And it's actually one of the things that brought me out here to Seattle was some of my past kept haunting me and it sucked. And it was so unfair that after years of no matter what I did, it's like things things catch up to you and you're like, I can never catch a break. I'm done, you know, and um, and I'll, I'll never forget. There was there was a gentleman that I dated who was a really poor choice, right? And <laughs> and uh, what happened is that everyone in AA in New Jersey thought that too, but I didn't know that at the time. And you know, I I, I was like five years sober and done so many rounds of sex, and I you know was finally ready to start dating again. Do you know what I mean? Like that thing, like. <clears throat> <laughs> and um and I go and I go on a date with someone wonderful and he and he stops me and he says so I heard about such and such and such and I'm like you know I though I appreciate you coming out and asking me about the gossip that I've heard I am upset that I didn't get the chance to tell you that myself and that my inventory has to be you know carried across from other people's mouths and so the thing in AA here is that we do not gossip about each other like Feel free to share my story. Whatever I share from the podium is fair game for you to talk about. It absolutely is. Whatever I talk with you on the phone or, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, that is not for sharing unless you ask my permission, right? And um, and I've done this for sponsees where I needed to, you know, there are some really heavy stuff, things that, that are not talked about at podium. And I will call that person and say, can I put you in touch with so-and-so? Or you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the name. I'd say, can I put you in touch with someone who has this issue that you told me about? Can you know so you guys can talk about it because I'm not going to pretend to know about it. I'm not going to pretend to have gone through that issue, and um, and I also want to keep your anonymity about it. You know, so there's this respect that we have each other here in AA, and so that that brings me to my full circle thing for today is um, you know, AA is this beautiful, safe place, and it's our job to keep it that way. And if I am not keeping AA a safe place, I better be looking at that and talking to my sponsor about it. You know, I have these traditions to, to keep me backed up. Like, I keep my, my opinions, right? My opinions need to be kept in check. This is not the place to talk about them. You know, I, I am here to practice principles. This is my locker room. And if you guys dare do anything to my locker room, I'll get you down. Like, I will, you know? Like I, and, and I've done that, you know? And so if, if we're not using this safe place to, to help each other grow and bring ourselves all closer to God, then what's the point, right? And so, like... You know, we, we don't sit and criticize each other. You know, that's not the point of it. It's not about judging each other's sobriety or any, like, that's not the point. The point is, is that I get to be up here and tell you guys that I've been sober since I was 22. I'm 31, right? And like, I'm in medical school. And even though I've had a funky two days, like, I'm pretty darn grateful. I'm doing pretty darn good. You know what I mean? And, um, and that I showed up here anyway. I'm not in my bed hold up. And, um, that's because you guys keep it a safe place. And it's, it's, uh, I remember when my sponsor told me after I got five years sober, she said, Oh, now it's up to you to, um, not the AA police, but how did she say it? She said, now I can't just sit back and watch people do these things. She said, it is now my responsibility as someone who's sober over five years to, to stop people from doing that. You know what I mean? I cannot, again, sit back and watch things happen and consider that to be okay. Cause that action is that inaction is still an action and I'm responsible for that. Right. And so, and I've done that and, and I have not made friends in AA and you know, I'm really grateful for that. I, I've gone over and I've been like, uh, uh you're talking to a new girl. Like, no, where's your sponsor? I don't respect men who talk to new girls. Right. Like I do that. And they're like, Oh, I hate you. <laughs> like, you know, I would put it on your test app. I don't know what to tell you. Like, you know, and, um, I do the same thing with girls, you know, I'm like, come sit with me, you know, and if I see them sitting next to the guy and I'm like, you don't want to say sober, call me when you're ready, you know, it's like the same thing. And um, so I'm really grateful that, that you guys taught me how to do that and that you guys gave me 
the cojones to be able to say that without needing to be like an inner city kid about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't need to be rough and tumble and badass about it. I, uh, I just, I just am because I'm here with integrity, you know? So I hope uh, I carried a message and this thing is terrifying me again. Okay, thank you. <laughs>